everyone. In this lesson, we are continuing our journey through the wonderful world of waves. Uh, just to recap where we've been so far on this journey in our first lesson, we focused on some of the basics of waves, like what is a wave? What are some of the basic characteristics of waves, like frequency, wavelength, amplitude, stuff like that. Um, and then in our second lesson, uh, we focused in on the relationships among some of those different characteristics. So discovering things like frequency and wavelength are inversely related to each other. And the speed of a wave is independent of all of those characteristics, uh, except for the medium that the wave is traveling through. So now that we've got some of those basics of what a wave is and some of the ways that we can characterize and describe waves uh, sort of under our belt at this point, uh, in this lesson we're going to be focusing in on um, some of the, the more unusual behaviors of waves and how they interact with each other and how they interact with matter around them. So let's get started. So first of all, um, where did this idea of waves even come from? So we're familiar with sound, we're familiar with light. Why is it that we model these things as waves rather than assuming that there's some sort of like sound particle that moves through the air to allow you to hear me right now? What is it that makes a wave a wave and distinct from from particles and matter in general? And really, it comes down to the behaviors that we see waves exhibiting that are just different from how actual concrete, tangible objects tend to behave. And so we're going to talk about a number of those sort of wave unique behaviors in this lesson, things like reflection, interference, the Doppler effect, and then a couple others are refraction and diffraction. But we're going to save those for next lesson just because those first three reflection interference and the Doppler effect are actually going to keep us really busy during this lesson. So um, we'll we'll get to all the, the refraction diffraction stuff. Uh, next time when we focus in on light and why light is just the weirdest and totally cool. All right. um, so getting into some of those behaviors of waves then. The first one, one that, that's probably the, the gentlest and nicest and, and easiest to understand, is the idea of reflection, which is uh, the phenomenon where a wave bounces back out of boundary. It's going along through space, it hits something, and then the wave travels back again uh, in the same direction that it came from. So uh, we started looking at that a little bit in the investigation. You had a chance to, to try sending waves down along a string and see how they reflected back at, um, at these different boundaries here. So then um, let's revisit really quickly how a wave reflects differently at a fixed or what we might call a closed end versus how a wave will reflect from a loose or what we might call open end. So to do that, let's go ahead and open that, uh, that simulation here once again. So um, we've got the same general setup here. We're going to send a pulse down the string, and we'll start off with a fixed end here where the string is stuck in a clamp. This little green dot here cannot move. If I send that pulse down, okay, I see that um, originally the, the displacement, the disturbance um, for the, the parts of the string was in the positive or, or upward direction, right? The initial pulse uh, was above the string, and then after it reflected, the uh, the wave went back below the string. But the little green dot there at the very end on the far right remained fixed in place, okay? That's going to end up being important. Now, we're going to restart this. We're going to switch over to, oh, I got to move myself here. All right, cool. To it being a loose end. I'm going to move myself back up. Yay. All right. Um, Loose end, we'll see how it behaves this time. All right. All right. So interesting thing about the way that it reflects off the loose end is that, first of all, it's reflecting back with the um, the disturbance uh, being on the same side of the string. So if our particles originally got displaced upward uh, in the original wave, then they're continuing to, to be displaced upward in the reflected wave as well. What's also interesting about this is that it means that now our, our green dot is able to move a whole bunch over here on the, the far right side. It's able to actually experience the full amplitude of the wave pulse. And that will be important in a little bit. All right. So let's jump back in over here. So then um, another phenomenon that you saw in your investigation was interference. All right. And this occurs when we have multiple waves that are both occupying the same space at the same time. Now this is different from 
from objects, from particles, right? Because if I'm sitting here, you can't also be sitting in the exact same space as me. Like we cannot both like just overlap each other. Um, that would be painful. So, um, but waves, waves can do this. Um, it's no problem at all. And so we see interference in this simulator or in this, um, this animation here between the green wave, which is moving to the right, and the blue wave, which is moving to the left. There are some places where they overlap um, and they, they add together. There are some places where they are perfectly out of phase with each other. Um, and so when we're talking about this idea of interference and these these multiple waves uh, kind of affecting each other and and, um, and having a, a combined effect, uh, that it, it's helpful to think about two different major types then of interference that we can experience, okay? So the first type is what we call constructive interference. When we think about constructing things, we think about building things up. And so constructive interference is when we have two waves that overlap um, when they're both kind of, uh, their disturbance are in the same direction, all right? And as a result, our waves add together to a greater amplitude. So we see here um, on the, the top of this image, two wave pulses where uh, particles are being disturbed upward. For both of them and so they're both moving along here and then when they meet and when they interfere with each other in the middle those two amplitudes add together so you end up with a single wave pulse that is twice the amplitude of both of the original wave pulses okay so it adds up they're twice the high and then they keep moving back and and past each other and so on and so forth but we see that in that moment where they are interfering and overlapping we get a greater amplitude because the two waves are adding together now, as you might guess, then, um, the other type of interference, aside from constructive interference, where the two waves add together, is destructive interference. Um, and when we think of destruction, we think of tearing things down, right? So um, destructive interference is where you have two waves that are essentially canceling each other out. The disturbances are going in opposite directions. So we see here um, one where the wave pulse is, is going up, another where the wave pulse is directed downward. When the two of them meet, they add together to zero. Um, and so those cancel out. We get no wave for a little bit while the two waves are overlapping and interfering with each other. And then the wave pulses continue on their happy way. All right. So um, when we have interference, there are two major possibilities. Then there, there are some places where we can have constructive interference and some places where we can have destructive interference. And so when we start thinking of waves as um, continuous oscillations rather than single pulses, like we saw in those those previous two pictures here, what we end up is not always constructive interference and not always destructive interference, but sometimes we get um, these these patterns where we get both um, in, in alternating turns, essentially. Um, and if we have two waves that are um, that are interfering with each other in just the right way, we can end up getting standing waves, all right? Now, in order to get standing waves, um, typically you have to have your two waves that are interfering be at the same frequency as each other. And so the most common way then to get these standing waves is if um, the second wave that's interfering is just the reflection of the first wave. Okay, so we can imagine for this uh, this animation right here that the green wave is moving to the right, it's bouncing off some boundary and then returning in the form of the blue wave. And so as a result, those two waves are operating at the same wavelength um, and, and match each other really nicely. And so if then that wavelength of those waves is um, is nicely matched to the dimensions of the space in which the waves are are moving. So the the length of the uh, the chamber right here, this pipe, is maybe a, a multiple of the wavelength of this wave. Um, we can end up with with these nice, cute standing waves here, where it doesn't really look like um, the wave is moving to the right or moving to the left. It's just kind of like bouncing up and down in place. And that's what we see with this red wave right here. So the red wave is the sum of both the green and the blue wave as they interfere. And the red wave doesn't really appear like it's moving one way or the other horizontally. It's just kind of like bobbing down, up and down in, in place right there. Um, so this is very cute as an animation and all of that. But I just want to give you a chance to like actually visually see some standing waves. Um, and it's hard to see sound waves and it's, um, well, it's hard to see the wave properties of, of light waves. So uh, to see this, 
Let's look at some water waves, all right? So um, this is uh, within a pool, obviously, of water. We've got a, a wave generator at the far end over there where basically you just have this, um, this sheet that's moving back and forth at a consistent rate. Um, and so the waves are moving down and then bouncing off of the boundary, which is sort of in the foreground of this video. Um, but if we go ahead and uh, and watch this, we'll see that the uh, the timing of the waves, the frequency of those waves being produced is perfectly matched to the distance between uh, the two boundaries here, between the wave generator and the boundary that it's it's bouncing off of. So. Whoa, it's trippy. So we see there that the wave just sort of appears to be just sort of like bouncing up and down in place. There isn't a strong sense of it moving in one direction or the other. It's just kind of kind of bouncing. All right, and there are some places where we see a lot of destructive interference right here, and then places where we see a lot of constructive interference um, happening right here. So cute. All right. So that's a standing wave. Um, now, to further break down the, the anatomy of a standing wave, there are a couple key features that I want us to focus on. So we're taking out the individual like component waves for, for this part. We're just focusing on the standing wave that's being produced. Now, there are two major features of any standing wave. You've got nodes, um, which are locations where there's a consistent destructive interference where you've got your particles that appear to be fixed in place and not moving at all right and then uh on the the, the flip side of that there are also locations that are called anti-nodes which are places where we get um a lot of constructive interference and where we see the maximum amplitude of the wave uh, that's being produced okay so let's go ahead and, and consider this standing wave uh, right here in front of us so when you look at those uh, those red dots that are located along there how would you describe those red dots what do they represent well those red dots are stuck in place those are parts of the wave that don't appear to be moving at all which means those are locations of destructive interference those are nodes in this standing wave all right, where if this were, were representing a wave through a string, that's parts of the string that aren't moving. They're just kind of sitting there while everything else is moving around them. All right, so we have these locations of our nodes then. Um, what about the anti-nodes? How many anti-nodes do you see in this standing wave? Hopefully you counted four. Four anti-nodes, places where we see the, the maximum amplitude, the peaks and the troughs of our standing wave. So we've got one over at the far left end and then one in between each pair of nodes. We always get this this alternating na 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 Batman whatever um alternating between nodes and anti-nodes uh when we're looking at the uh the anatomy of the standing wave. All right. Cool. Now, um as long as we're talking about standing waves, we've got to talk about this idea of resonance. So as I said, um, standing waves can only form when uh, the waves are, are uniquely matched to the dimensions of the object, the, the chamber, uh, the pipe, the string, the, uh, the length of the pool, whatever the object is that the waves are traveling through. Not any frequency can form standing waves. There are only very particular ones that can form standing waves. And this is related to um, what's called the natural frequency of the, uh, the object that the waves are moving through. So all objects sort of have this natural frequency, this natural um, way that they will tend to oscillate if they're being disturbed. And so I tend to, when I think of natural frequency, I think about like um, a kid on a swing, right? That if you push a kid on a swing, um, it's not like sometimes they're going back and forth really, really fast. And sometimes they're going like super duper slow. Like you push a kid on a swing and they're always gonna be swinging back and forth um, at about the same rate for a given swing, that is. All right. Um, now, if you have a kid who's swinging and you don't just let them like do their own thing, pump their legs, you actually go in and then push um, in time with their swinging, you can get them to swing higher and higher and higher. And this is a phenomenon that we call 
resonance, okay? So resonance occurs when we have either an additional wave that's constructively interfering or an applied force that's being timed with the natural frequency that will tend to amplify those natural vibrations for the object. OK, now sometimes this is fun, like if you're a kid on a swing and you're getting pushed in time with your swinging, then you go higher and it's great and you're having a wonderful time. Other times, um, resonance can be problematic, like for the uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington. Um, and so this uh, this was a bridge that was constructed back in 1940. Um, and it was like this big deal when it was constructed. Everyone was super excited about it. And like there was a big parade across. Blah, 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 right. Um, but then here here was the thing. Um, we ended up on this one particular day, not too long after the opening of the bridge, when the wind was blowing across the bridge. And we think of wind as like whatever, like it's the wind okay um and it wasn't even like a super crazy like hurricane level high wind it was a wind all right um but it was going and hitting the bridge in such a way that it was providing resonance the patterns in which the uh, the wind was striking the bridge amplified the natural frequency of the bridge right so the bridge already has a natural frequency that like if it gets hit it'll kind of like wobble a little bit vibrate a little bit but then the wind was just consistently hitting it in time with this natural frequency. And as a result, we ended up with this. Yeah, that's, that's a regular bridge. It's not like an elastic bridge. It is a concrete bridge. As you can see, cars would, would normally be driving across. Um, and again, what's causing this level of, of oscillation and, and swaying for this bridge? It's just the wind, right? So the wind by itself, not really a big deal. But if it's matching that natural frequency of the bridge, then we end up with um, some pretty, pretty significant problems, pretty significant amplification of that natural frequency and those natural vibrations, right? And then obviously you wanna see it coming down. Right. Somewhere over here, uh, there we go. Down it goes, from the wind, it's crazy. All right, um, just so you know, cause I know you're very concerned about this, uh, no people were hurt during this process, so yay, um, that's that's nice. Okay, so um, resonance can be fun, like on a swing. It can be destructive, like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, or um, if you've ever heard of, like, seen the whole, like, opera singer breaking, shattering the wine glasses, that's the same idea, where where the singer is matching the natural frequency of the the glass, um, and then the glass vibrates so much that it, it cannot, cannot stay intact, and it, it shatters, so. Fun. All right. Um, but another use of resonance and one that we're going to going to definitely be capitalizing on in this unit is musical instruments. All right. So the way that musical instrument in, uh, instruments work is through resonance. OK. And so what we get in any musical instrument is standing waves that are occurring at the natural frequency of the string, the pipe, the bar, whatever it is that uh, that your musical instrument is made out of. All right. Now, um, the the features of the standing wave are going to depend on what type of instrument you're dealing with. So any place where you have a fixed point at the end of your instrument, there's going to have to be a node in the standing wave at that location. So if you've got like a closed end of a pipe, like uh, the end of a clarinet where you're blowing into it or the end of a string where that's fixed in place, your standing wave had better have a node right there or else there's no way for the standing wave to, to form and continue. But at open points, like say um, if you have an open end of a pipe, like on a flute or uh, the free end of a bar, if you've got like a bar just hanging out and it's just fixed on one side and then you just smack it, um, there should be anti-nodes there where uh, the standing wave is free to, to oscillate at its maximum amplitude. All right, I know that's like a ton of information I just dumped on you really quickly there. We'll take some time to, to consider un or continue unpacking what all this means for your musical instruments, but just wanted to like throw a quick. All right, 
So I think we're going to stop it there. I know I said in the beginning that we were going to talk about the Doppler effect, but I realized this video is going kind of a while and I don't want to overload you right now. So let's just, um, we're going to stick with reflection interference, standing waves, natural frequency, resonance, and kind of call it a day there. And uh, we'll talk about the other phenomena next time. Okay, so one final check for understanding. So um, some of you may know that auditoriums sometimes, if they're not um, not super carefully designed, can have something called dead spots, which is um, a particular location in the, the concert hall or, or wherever it is, where um, uh, a, a, an observer, an audience member is sitting. And even though they're not that especially far away from the performers or anything like that, they really have a hard time hearing them. The sound is somehow muffled or muted. So which of the wave behaviors that we have been talking about best explains this phenomenon? Well, what we're dealing with here is that um, if you can't hear the, the sound waves, that means there must be a drop in the amplitude of those sound waves. And um, the one phenomenon that we've discussed that, that could explain a, a decreased amplitude of interference. All right, reflection doesn't produce any particular change in amplitude that we saw. Resonance actually tends to increase the amplitude of a sound wave, and uh, we skip Doppler effects, so you know it's not that one, but interference can um, can either increase or decrease the amplitude of a, a wave, and specifically destructive interference will, will decrease it. So if you're not careful, you have your speakers located such that those waves are going to be out of phase with each other and they're going to cancel each other out, you're not going to be able to hear those sound waves um, because they're they're subtracting from each other essentially. All right. So those are some of the basics about um, some of the most relevant wave behaviors to help you get started on your musical instrument. So I'm going to have you practice with that. Hopefully, we're going to be able to create some some beautiful functional musical instruments using some of these principles. All right. That's it. Good luck.